welcome to the NewsX Sunday Guardian Roundtable. Well, the budget of the year has been announced. Well, was it a once in a lifetime budget as was advertised or does it fall short of their expectation? Is it at least the right budget for the times? Have the right uh, optics been looked at? Have the right deliverables been announced? That is something we're going to be discussing on Roundtable today. Joining me is Manish Tiwari. He is uh, a former INB minister of the UPA government, Congress uh, MP from the Lok Sabha. Uh, Shankar Ayer, he is written, uh, he's an economist. He's also a uh, uh, policy wonk. He's written uh, a book on Adhar, the Gated Republic, Sanjay Baru, also uh, well known in the field of economics, economist, policy, and of course, he's written a book, uh, he recently edited a book, Beyond COVID Cover, uh, looking at the economic resurgence, uh, you know, post-COVID, post, -COVID, post uh, during COVID, post-lockdown. Manish, um, I give the floor to you. Does the budget meet your expectations? You know, uh, I know the Congress has a point of view, but uh, leaving the uh, politics aside. Uh, no, Priya, thank you very much. It's always a pleasure uh, to be on your show, and especially with two such eminent, articulate, and erudite people. Uh, you know, every budget has a context. And the uh, context of this budget is that the Indian uh, uh, growth numbers, uh, the GDP has been in sequential decline for 37 months now. The fact is that you've had the highest demand in Manriga ever since the program was institutionalized in 2006. Over 12 crore people have applied for work under Manriga and uh, 3.5 crore of them in the last two months of December and January respectively. The uh, Indian unemployment rate in December was at 9%, over 9%, an all-time high. And uh, all that this ill-conceived lockdown uh, was able to do was flatten the economy further rather than flattening the disease curve. We still have 10% of the total number of COVID-19 cases in the world. Now, what the finance minister got as a consequence of this four years of mismanagement the economy, which started with the demonetization in 2016, is an 18 lakh crore hole in our budget. So therefore, you've got an unprecedented budget deficit, and you cannot blame it all on COVID-19. So essentially, what she's tried to do is that, A, she's tried to fix that hole in the budget. And the antidote that she's found is really trying to sell the entire public sector lock, stock, and barrel. Whether it succeeds or not, I do not know because they've been trying with Air India for the last three and a half years. That uh, seems to be going absolutely nowhere. In addition to that, there mm. are two very obvious contradictory uh, pulls in this bu budget. So on one hand, you talk about Atam Nirbhar Bharat, the self-reliance that we touted from 19... Uh, 47 to 1991, when the world collapsed around us and we had to reset our uh, economic trajectory. And the second is that you actually want to liberalize the economy, you know, bring in more foreign direct investment. You've taken the FDI and insurance up to 74%. So there seems to be a lack of uh, coherence in the budget, uh, if I may say so. <coughs> Did the finance minister have any options? Well, I don't think so, because given the fact that uh, growth is extremely sluggish even now, you know, the economy, uh, despite all those mini budgets that she talked about, the Atam Nirbhar package uh, has not really fired up. You know, demand continues to be sluggish. Uh, so therefore, she's actually tried to uh, serve the best pish -pash that she could make. Pash, uh, Shankar, is that uh, one way of looking at the budget? All budgets are bets. They are gambits on how things will process. So there is one thing that she has accomplished on day one of the budget, that she has put a lid on this entire speculation of her being replaced tomorrow, day after, next month, next reshuffle and all that. So that is... Uh, one accomplishment. The second is that she seems to have ticked all the boxes for, for a variety of reasons, the interplay of politics and expectations. People expected the worst and didn't uh, find much to complain about. That has given this budget an aura of feel good. 
Now, whether that feel good actually translates in the economy depends on four factors. How we roll out the vaccination, how state governments are able to partner with the center in these ambitious plans for Jal Jeevan and Swachh Bharat and all those. The track record of state government spending is pretty sketchy. Third is the uh, aspect of disinvestment. I mean, the first list of disinvestment came out in 2016. There were 23 companies. The only real major disinvestment that Big Tech happened is the sale of HPCL to another government-owned company called ONGC. So disinvestment is dysfunctional, stall, whatever, however you want to see it. The fourth and the more worrying thing is, I always say, and people would tell you that money makes the mayor go and money is critical. The RBI has said that the NPA levels could go as much as 13.5%, which is roughly around 15 lakh crores by September. Now, it may not, if recovery happens, it might be 12 or 10, whatever. The, the issue is that the inventory of past since is not getting cleared in the financial sector. So you still have the ILFS problem, you have the NPS in public sector banks. So there is no, uh, uh, the idea of creating the bank for governance and all of that has sort of not gone anywhere. So these are really the tripwires of this budget. You know, anything, if, if the budget sort of fails or if it has to succeed, they must manage all these four issues. And to me, the way we roll out the vaccination is going to be very critical. We are currently vaccinating about 300,000 to 3 lakh people. The government's target is 300 million by August. At that rate, they should be vaccinating 1.5 million people every day. And that's nowhere near. And at current rates, it might probably take them 900 days to reach the 300 million target. So how they do it? Why shouldn't they partner with private sector? Why shouldn't employers be allowed to vaccinate employees? Why shouldn't Priya Sehgal, if she can afford to pay for her vaccination, go to uh, her chosen private healthcare person? And so there are issues of indemnity, logistics, all that. So these have to be worked out. Only so the, the the only way to recovery is to improve engagement in the economy, and I think that is the big question here. Has that happened? Improved engagement in the economy? Do you feel? And has the government lowered the bar so much that, as Shankar says, you know, we didn't have any negatives in the budget. It was a relief itself that there were no increase in tax, there was no COVID sex, so everybody was very happy. Well, I think the most important thing of, about this budget is that uh, our expectations were very low. And therefore, given the low expectations, a, even a de halfway decent uh, framework has got high marks. So let, let's not cavil about the fact that the, uh, there has been a universal uh, you know, uh, acceptance of the overall uh, strategy of the budget. I think by and large, uh, except the uh, opposition part, political parties, uh, most economists have welcomed it. But they welcomed it for two reasons. One, because as I said, expectations were lowered by this government over the last six years. Uh, I've been a critic in, in the last six years. In fact, the very first Arun Jaitley budget of uh, July 2014, uh, I was very disappointed and I wrote. And every single column of mine over the last five, six years is all published. Uh, I've been cr critical of the budget, but this year I, I, I uh, praised Nirvala. And in fact, I, somebody called me um, and wanted to interview me on this very subject. They said, you're, you're, why are you uh, supporting a budget when for the last five years you've criticized? So I said, thank you very much for reading all my columns. But there are two reasons why I think uh, this budget clicked. One, as I said, low expectations. The second is that it has... Uh, done away with this obsession about the fiscal deficit. You know, I, I am a Keynesian. I have long argued in favor of higher deficits, uh, but the orthodoxy since the early 90s uh, was against uh, high deficits. Uh, in fact, I, I remember when Manmohan Singh did the farm loan waiver um, and he was being criticized for the farm loan waiver because it was going to raise the 
government's deficit. I actually went and met Prabhat Patnaik, a left economist at JNU, and said, look, all of you call Manmohan Singh a neoliberal economist, but look at the way he is using Keynesian policy to revive demand. So why don't you on the left support Manmohan Singh? But of course, the left at, at that time was not willing to support him on the budget. But the reality is that the, or, the economic orthodoxy in this country, to which a large number of economists who today are supporting the budget were all uh, you know, sub subscribers to that orthodoxy, was uh, the low fiscal deficits are good. And I think Nirmala Sitaraman has now taken the bull by its horns. She allowed a chapter to be published in the economic survey questioning the very rationale of credit rating agencies. I would like to take some credit to the fact that in 1990, uh, September 1990, Six months before the actual crisis, I wrote a column in the Economic Times questioning the logic of rating agencies. And that the fact is that many of us have questioned the logic of rating agencies when downgrading India. And I think the fact that the government has now officially done that in the economic survey was, was very good. Uh, and spending more than what you earn, given the collapse of revenues this year, was a courageous decision. Rest of it, I mean, we have to see disinvestment. I agree with the points that uh, Shankar has made. Um, as far as Mr. Tiwari's views are concerned, well, the Congress Party began disinvestment in 1991. Uh, and, you know, different governments have tried to do differing degrees of success. Uh, Narsimha Rao tried, Gujarat tried, Vajpayee tried, Dr. Manmohan Singh tried. But, you know, it all depends on the market, the mood. And I agree that right now, uh, the Air India, for example, has so far been a failure. Um, but I think a lot of what has happened in the world today may make the uh, market a little more favorable for disinvestment. You want to come in and also people are arguing that, you know, you can't say disinvestment is selling the family silver because it's really now, you know, it's uh, most of the PSUs are so old and rusted that it will be a good thing for the government to get them off their block. You know, they just lost. No, I have no problem with saying it's selling the family silver. You know, old silver gets uh, jaded. You know, <laughs> disinvestment is like polishing the old family silver. It is family silver. Let's face it. Uh, it is family silver. You're selling family silver because you're in debt. Uh, and let me end with another nice story that uh, when IMF, uh, Narsimha Rao took the IMF loan and the left was criticizing him. I asked Narsimha Rao, I said, look, you are being criticized for taking a loan from the IMF and listening to the diktats of the IMF. So Narsimha Rao said, look, you, don't, you urban boys don't understand. Go to a village and tell them that I've taken a loan from a foreigner and the foreigner is twisting my arms. Who's, on whose side will the villager be? On my side or on the IMF side? He said, people sympathize with the borrower. They don't attack the borrower. So I think <laughs> the fact is the government of India today has decided to increase debt, increase its borrowing, because it's telling the people I'm bankrupt. And that's an honest truth. They are bankrupt. Well, one way to get sympathy, Manish, for the government. <laughs> well, uh, you know, on a lighter note, uh, going after rating agencies is very much like growing, going after Greta Thornburg. So therefore, <laughs> you know, when it suits you, you know, you storm the rating agencies. And, you know, when the rating agencies actually start showing you the mirror, then you get the economic survey to write reams, you know, questioning the very rationale of uh, rating agencies. Yeah, that's a bit rich. But uh, Priya, on a larger point, uh, Dr. Baru <clears throat> and Shankar are absolutely correct. There was a Washington consensus which has held the field between 1991 and 2021 for over uh, two decades. And one of the pillars of the Washington consensus was austerity, that you need to balance your budgets. You do not need to live beyond your means. Unfortunately, uh, for the World Bank and the IMF, you had a situation where the entire global economy just came tumbling down like nine pins because when five billion of the eight billion people on planet Earth were in some kind of a lockdown or the other, I mean, you had uh, uh, crude oil actually going below zero, whereby uh, people had to pay to store them for that uh, those couple of weeks. So yes, it was an unprecedented situation. However, if we would have handled our economy better between 2016 and 2020, we would have been better prepared for this rainy day. 
you know the the fact is that how much ever you may want to lampoon the upa government you may want to uh, critique uh, those 10 years the fact remains that the indian economy grew at 8% year on year for 10 long years i don't think anybody can take that fact away the uh, finance minister in a previous budget speech acknowledged that over 271 million people were lifted out of poverty uh, in those 10 years between 2014 and uh, 2004 and 14 it's another matter that she fudged it a bit by saying 2006 to 16 but i believe the actual report says 2004 to 14 the third thing is you know what the budget also demonstrates is the vulnerability of india you know when the government pats itself on the back and says to 80 crore people it just goes to show how vulnerable our economy is if it does not keep growing at you know an x percentage you know 7 8 9% it's very easy for those people who are vulnerable to really slip below the poverty line and 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 and, and what these last 10 months have really demonstrated unequivocally is that the income inequality in this country has actually grown exponentially while 30 odd billionaires may have added a couple of more zeros to their wealth for the substantive bulk of the people you know it's 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 become a life of penury so therefore when we talk about the budget you know which is the india that we are talking about are we talking about the simmering india which is now out in the streets and protesting uh, because the farmers agitation in more ways than one is the culmination of a lot of economic frustration or are we talking about that scared india uh, which unfortunately has to uh, has to uh, clap whenever a budget is presented you know because of the cbi and the ed and the income tax department and to end on a light and hot you know one thing which strikes me on budget day is and this i've been seeing for the last 20 years howsoever good bad or ugly the budget might be corporate india you know comes out like an orchestra in unison singing platitudes of the budget <laughs> i mean there is not a single one of them who has the gumption to call a spade a spade i'm not talking about this budget i'm generally making Every a budget <laughs> on the very supine spine of corporate india Shankar, I remember you and I were discussing, had a conversation before the budget, and you were said made a good point, which is we went from slow down to lockdown. You know, that's a phrase I've been using pretty often because that you know, so the budget in that sense we were already on a back foot even before the budget, uh, before lockdown, before COVID happened. Yeah, I mean, so I said somewhere that uh, the challenge before the budget was not just the COVID nineteen pandemic, but also the inventory of past sins. and the inventory of past sins is primarily what what the uh, uh sector uh, financial sector uh, issues and the financial sector issues uh for some reason or the other they tried various solutions and the nps kept rising and different analogies were provided raguram rajan said surgery is required somebody said uh you know um, uh, clean cleansing is required vipassana is required all of that has happened and we still have a problem in the financial sector which is an, you know ilfs went down about 2 years back and still nobody knows whether all the monies that they ilfs owes to all the people has been returned similarly dhfl another nbfc went down a, its status is indeterminate over 1000 cases are pending in the uh, company law tribunal on insolvency and bankruptcy court so these are issues that simply point out that government must get out of the business of lending money which is get out of the business of managing banks so uh, it, it, a larger point is of course that government must reconsider whether it must own all that it owns and manage all that it owns i mean sometimes you could own but not necessarily manage those enterprises so this value destruction that has happened in the last 10 years has to be recognized and thought of so i think this budget makes some steps towards that in terms of the arc in terms of a bad loans bank or however you call it but the systemic 
slot that is there i uh, one worries whether the intent will actually be implemented you know it is one thing to execute the intent but quite another thing to implement what has been promised and that is a worrisome fact for you know those who are looking for uh, the budget and to come back to my point about the vaccination process i think we we need a broader discussion on how the process goes i mean there has to be more uh, discussions on whether how to expand the access and enhance the speed i think this this is a conversation that needs to happen if india has to sort of hit the highway of growth uh, and to the point of the agitations and other things that happening i think how the government navigates the path in consultation collaboration and drawing consensus with the state governments will largely determine where we are at this point next year in terms of recovery and growth okay next budget already uh, dr varu what's the question for me the question is uh, you know the fact that uh, no, no. government was already on a back foot and uh, you know if you want to react so i think on, on the question of slow down to lockdown i th i think yeah. that is true it's uh, uh, that is why the expectations this year were low uh, and which is why uh, i am pleasantly surprised by the overall approach that nirmala sitharaman has taken because the fact is that this government in the last 6 years has not really understood the nature of the slowdown that has been underway for some time i keep reminding my audiences all the time that as manish tiwari correctly said you know we had 5 years of 8% growth between 2003 and 2009 10 um, and an average of about 7.5% during that decade and today we are below that and in the book which you just mentioned the book i have edited called uh, beyond covid shadow uh, where i have several economists contributing very good uh, articles uh, most of them take the view that going forward in the next 5 5 years certainly the rate of growth of the economy will be below 7.5% i don't think anybody in that book even those who are in government i mean i have people like rajiv kumar and vivek debra etc uh, contributing articles to that book but none of them take the view that the economy will go back to 7.5% which was the decadal rate of average rate of growth in the period from 2003 2014 uh, so we are looking really at a medium term growth rate of about 6% as a optimistic forecast for the next 5 years which means we will not be a 5 trillion dollar economy by that uh, end of the tenure of this government which was the original promise so there are serious problems for the economy there are serious problems of low of a reduced rate of investment of a reduced rate of saving and these are the kind of issues that need to be addressed in the medium term Uh, and i'm afraid that you know given the focus of the government on so many no, uh, non economic issues and political issues and the bad political management whether of farmers agitation or of the migrants problem or of uh, freedom of expression etc that there isn't enough energy in the government to focus on the economy so these are all my medium term worries but since the discussion is about this budget i do think that nirmala sitaraman has done her best given the constraints under which she was working constraints imposed by the lockdown constraints imposed by the the inability of gst to mobilize taxes the collapse in revenues so when you ask the question from slow down to lockdown you know we have might maybe overcome the impact of lockdown we have not overcome the impact of the slow down and to reverse that you really have need a medium term agenda of reform and of encouraging investment if this budget succeeds in encouraging investment well and good let's see when say you at uh, the let's see does that bring you some optimism at all you know there was early on talk that this could be nirmala's 91 moment has that been at least looked at well uh, <clears throat> i don't know 91 moment or 1857 moment uh, that is uh, i think more more metaphorical but uh, dr baru is absolutely correct you know while we may uh, have rebounded to some extent out of the lockdown but the slow down is going to take a lot of working on and uh, this government is now in its six and a half uh, as has finished about six and a half years and uh, you know once you have these mass agitations uh, starting to proliferate across the country 
the space for any kind of very bold economic initiatives uh, keep shrinking. You know, if you look at the trajectory of various governments over the years, uh, you would find that uh, if you've had a 10 year uh, stint uh, in about the after the sixth year, you start going into uh, a sort of a downward spiral. And if they continue handling the farmers' agitation in the manner in which they are, by driving nails and spikes into the road, I'm afraid you're only uh, uh, fanning passions further. And the last point, uh, Priya, which I would like to make since uh, you know I have a flight to catch. You see, uh, if you require economic progress, you need to have social harmony in this country. Absolutely. Since, since 2014, you know, this country has been kept on the slow boil of polarization. And so, therefore, if you are going to have communal discord, I'm afraid you are not going to attract foreign investment. Money is a coward. Money goes to the safest harbor. And money does not see India as a very safe harbor. If you read uh, whatever has been written about India, in the Financial Times, in the New York Times, in the Washington Post, in the Le Monde, over the past two and a half years, especially, I, there's not a single positive thing. I mean, there's been stories of lynchings, and then you had Jammu and Kashmir, and then you've had various other things. So where is the India story? I mean, any investor who is going to really be looking to come to India, you know, he's going to be reading that and not the organizer. Thank you so much, all of you, for this conversation. And I would agree with Manish, actually, at the risk of being trolled on social media, that a lot of it, uh, you know, it's not just the economic story has to be also connected with our social story. And there has been some bad optics in the recent uh, times that have been going out. But uh, thank you all for this conversation. And I hope you all enjoyed watching this show. For more such videos, subscribe to the NewsX YouTube channel. Hit the bell icon.